Good evening, and welcome back to my YouTube channel, Defining Virtuosity. I'm Odin Ratham, uh, professor of violin at Cleveland State University. And tonight, um, we're going to combine virtues, talk about combining and organizing virtues in a way that um, leads to an interpretation of a work. In this particular case, I want to work with all of you on the coda from the third um, sonate pour violon seul, um, Ballade, of, of Eugene Isaï. Um, I've always been a, a movie fan and loved watching certain movies because they inspired me in some way. And some of the movies that have inspired me, um, don't laugh, have been the Star Trek, Star Trek films. Um, the Rocky movies, um, and the Star Wars films. And there are some particular characters in there that I would like to be present in tonight's proceedings. Uh, first of all, Yoda. I want to talk to you about Yoda a little bit. Um, in Galamian's uh, book, at the preface, there's a quote saying, he who is happiest is he that has himself under his own control. And I believe that Galamian sought wild stallions with great impulses and emotion and flair and giftedness, but then taught them to discipline this and to control it. You know, the force was strong in them, so to speak. And yet they had to discipline themselves and control this force so that it didn't run away with them and make them unable to control outcomes in their music making. That's one. The other is the idea, I love the idea of the underdog, of Rocky, of, of not ever underestimating what you can do with an instrument. Um, I think that talent is very important, but I think it is also overrated in the equation of things. Um, I think it accounts for about 5%, a very important 5% that has to be there, and that hard work is another 15%, and the other 80% is keeping your head screwed on straight. And that's sort of a loose quote of Gidon Kramer, uh, and it resonated with me. That, that we have to keep our, our ego under control, our um, self-doubt, all kinds of other psychological things under control when we're playing the instrument. Um, Spock is there for the same reason as Yoda, being in control of our emotions and not letting them run away with us, even if they are very strong and deeply felt. Um, that's great if you have them. That's uh, X factor. It's something that can not be taught um, if you feel, feel music that way, but we have to manage it at all times. Um, the final movie that I'm crazy about, um, is the karate kid because a young student comes to Mr. Miyagi and, and Mr. Miyagi makes him do a few very, very simple things over and over again. And this kid gets more and more frustrated <laughs> until he finally speaks up and confronts Mr. Miyagi about this. And Mr. Miyagi then um, asks him to show some of the movements of what he's been learning and proceeds to attack him and um, completely subconsciously, um, Danielson does all of the correct motions to defend himself. And so a point is made. Now, those of you that have been following my videos for the past um, week or so now have probably seen me demonstrate some very, very simple things with the bow in terms of being able to pivot with angles of the arm, with, um, a triangle shape at the frog, a square at the middle and a, another triangle at the tip. And, and then on top of that, to make matters worse, I've posted the most fundamental etudes of Wolfhart and simple scale exercises, and you're going, can this guy even play, or what is it for, or what, and, and maybe you're wondering, am I wasting your time? 
Tonight, I'd like to show you how to, first of all, order your virtues. And secondly, combine them with a much more complex piece than the Veracini Allegro that seems to have appealed to more of you than a lot of the fundamental uh, exercises in between. So I've decided to demonstrate how we can take this and apply it to something with more complex problem solving involved. And I could demonstrate how um, I taught my student Casey Reed at the age of 13 to play Isai Balad and how we put the various elements together in a relaxed, non-intimidating way that allowed him to play the piece extremely well. So if we um, start with the coda of the, the um, ballad, there's a uh, D unison, followed by some detaches with a chromatic scale going up and leading to a, a tenth um, G and B flat on the A and E string. And then there's a famous string crossing passage um, that leads to a series of double stops where the theme is quoted again and leads to this incredible climax that has so much um, energy and forcefulness in it uh, musically. I think it's very important to break down these larger problems into the smaller variables we've been working with um, throughout the past week. Um, we've talked about uh, the collé. We can organize um, the two hands um, coordinated, thinking of more than one virtue at once if we slow things down enough. The first is that um, in the left hand, to um, refer back to my video on combining schools, I'm thinking very much of uh, about uh, three different things. I'm thinking of some of uh, Grigory Kalinowski's exercises on leaving the string quickly so that you, you feel a release at the moment after any impact. The idea of touching a string and releasing off of it, combined with the soft thumb described in one of, of Augustin Hadelik's um, recent videos, and Rodney Friend's fantastic discussion about the placement of the hand at angles that allow the dropping of fifths, and that the rhythm is very strict about when those things happen rather than the strength. So on the left hand, I'm, I'm really thinking about a very, very light left hand. In the bow, I'm thinking about some Galamian things. I'm thinking about ending every collé on the next strain uh, plane that I have to place. When we drop towards an upper string, this is just a feeling, feel like you drop inward at your upper arm, so you don't carry tension. If you drop in like this, you'll immediately get tight. Feel as though you drop in this way, towards the new string, a little bit. Um, it's a, a feeling. Um, and that you might go out more towards an upper string. Feel that the, the beginning of downward strokes on the downbows have a slightly more inward angle that you want, than you think. Otherwise, you might not be at 90 degrees to the string. And first, try at the very frog, just a simple exercise, because um, we can turn any piece of music into an exercise and any exercise into music. So if we just first work on... Okay. And then take the next grouping. Again, in my left hand, my finger placements are very much oriented towards fifths. However, light releasing in the first joint. Okay, that's the general feeling. To that, I I can now add a layer of what in each of the each of the four strings feel like. And you'll notice.
noticed that I I did give myself a whole figure, uh, an eight note figure. This has to do with what I taught in scales about zip files. If you remember, I said eventually we have to think of. <laughs> I want to program some of these zip files um, that way so that I don't have to think about each little tiny action, even though I'm paying attention to every one as I do it slowly. That's one way of practicing it. It's another way of practicing it. rhythms are really really important so and when we do them one of the things that I just encountered with myself um, and that I would counsel all of you to think about is to be very very calm very 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 calm I have a, um, a little lighting up statue of Yoda that's by my music stand that lights up that sometimes I turn on when I forget this um, that you think very, very relaxed. Just listen to your sound. that comes, I, I really like thinking a lot about the collé and about keeping the arm hanging on each of the planes that I'm working with the collé. I'll later practice it with a dropped spiccato. Sometimes I'll practice it with a dropped spiccato where I lengthen the vowel of, uh, of the note and eventually I'll get rid of some of the clicks. Uh, this passage, how do we, do, we have to think, how do we do that? and order the, the note's importance. The second two set of thirds are less important than the first. And, and so I like to create a feeling in the arm where they take care of themselves a little bit more than the first note. I might emphasize this a little bit. Might be a little less. Again, I'm observing the rules of pulling. Bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. And the shoulder is actually free, even though I'm, bo I'm bowing from the elbow, to drift that way. Okay, to drift back, even though I'm, I'm keeping the bow straight by having a good wrist hinge. So that that somehow... the left hand is still doing the, the three things that I said before. They fall, turn towards the fifth, able to drop at the first joint slightly. The fiddle is primarily balanced in the collarbone, the shoulder is not holding. All of the vibratos have to be releases. I'm at the new plane before the stroke, and I just simply execute a collet. Again, the bow slower than the left hand. The left hand is ahead, ready ahead, here. So when the stroke releases, the finger is also releasing at that point. Here, it's 
very important to understand from what Rodney was teaching and what um, Augustine was teaching in his videos, to have an angle, a position of the thumb, an angle of the arm that allows the hand to be placed relatively in fifths. I'll just show you what I mean. I have this. And in my mind, and this, that creates a good compromise to get from here without tension. That finger action, if you remember I said that we observe fanatically the rules that none of the seven finger actions cause increased tension in the thumb, squeezing up in the shoulder, or squeezing the, the inside of the index finger to the neck. you see there's a space there. The, the joints are all collapsible. So I'm observing those rules. That's why I have to go so slowly, because I'm thinking about a few things at once. We're combining variables, uh, right? If we get too confused, we eliminate some of them. And I'll, I'll explain that right now. I can also not vibrate every note. However, drop my fingers with conditions to vibrate. Thich Nhat Hanh talks about conditions for happiness, right? We have conditions for happiness. So I can put my fingers down in a way where... If I wanted to, I could, but I'm just being, I'm just focusing on one virtue, the lift and the drop, isolating it, or adding the, the drop with the release backward in the, in the joint. So I can drop it this way or, this next passage, ahead of the bow, the problem is that during the two open D's and A's, you actually should have your hand in a new place. When you're done, when you're done with this, you should be there already, so that you can focus on this. Okay, but now you shouldn't be there during the two D, D's and A's. You should be back there can focus on the shift of the half step. Then there, during the two A's, you have to be on the F sharp and the A, focusing on the shift. Then, during the rest, already prepared. Now here, we have a whole step shift of this minor third. We're on a B and a D, but we need to be on a C sharp and an E before the bow comes over there. Because by the time we get there, the, the finger has bounced back. It's not pressed down. So it's ready for this. How do we practice that? left hand is ahead. Now, of course, I'm not going to play it this way, but if those correlations aren't in place, if the mental commands aren't there ahead of the stroke, it won't correlate when we try to go faster, okay? Now, after this, we're presented with a, a series of chords. It's very important to transition the, um, the D and the F, how to get to the first chord. Here, I observe the rule of 
first leaving the thumb in place and then releasing it when the original first position frame is reached somewhere around fourth position or so. I don't initiate the shift there because it's not secure. Keep the fiddle still, initiate the shift in the hand, release. At the moment that the thumb does release, I may have a little pressure between my chin and collarbone, but not with my shoulder. I still want the shoulder free. It has to be able to roll and, and, and pivot and do all of these things that it needs to do to find the right angles for, again, the fifth placement. The fifth placement of this finger and this, but not really because that one we're just touching one string. And you can feel the first finger in a placement. Drop each of them independently. Later drop them in pairs as a group. And it, eventually it feels like there's a release off and a smooth transition down from, from this note. Right. And, and this makes it, it work better. So here are some of the details. Now, how do we put all of this together? Break it up into sections. We have to now add layers of artistry and everything to, to all of this, right? So we can think of... Um, the first section. <laughs> think of everything from here all the way to uh, there as the second section and then we can think of the third as from here to here and then this as a little epitaph yeah here I would observe Wengerhoff's rules from Rondo Capriccioso, making sure that you have some level of intention. Yeah, as you practice it, but slowly. Fingers first, bow next. Fingers first, bow next, sound third. sounds are releasing and do not vibrate at the shoulder. The biggest place I see my students getting tight is they're trying to do some lurching or some stuff or initiate their vibrato up here. Set up the conditions for a good vibrato a la Rodney Friend. Set up the conditions for a good vibrato. You can even practice it non-vibrato. <laughs> of those fingers fall collapsible and collapsible at the angles that they're naturally occurring don't try to twist it or do something weird can they fall that way so that the collapse and the release doesn't form a change in your angles really so we put this together slowly going to do to reach that first climax without getting tight or emotionally involved? Well, how do we create the tension in the sound? Well, we slow the bow speeds. That creates more resistance and we vibrate. It's not feeling tighter and tighter. That's what we want to make the audience do. We're in the business of emotional manipulation. 
but we have to be surgeons. So, as we go up, uh, here, when the left hand does that, don't tighten it. But, Closer to the bridge. And make sure you have a, a legato crossing. Circle. So I'll try it again. for the right sound. Add. That's the difference between intention and tension. We're vibrating, we're intensifying the bow, not the left hand. The climactic one, the leap of the oct octave. I've changed Mr. Izai's fingering here. That's just how I feel it. You can do it as printed in fourth position, of course. I would still feel the leap of the octave in the bow. Uh, There's a common modern tradition of playing this all too fast and not with the amount of bow that Mr. Izai asks for, very clearly. And Mr. Gingold showed me this. You're supposed to use a lot of bow on this, all right? The reason for that is we don't speed up too soon. And if we don't speed up too soon, we don't have to go quite as fast at the end to sound very fast. And we can play all of the notes as they were written, which is a good thing. The stranger the music, the more correctly we should try to play it. So I'm not one of the proponents of seeing who can get to the end of this piece the fast in a whirlwind. One of my students, former students, recently recorded this, and for my taste, it was a little bit, you know, a little bit questionable how fast and how much we can actually hear, because these notes are all important uh, when you get to this. Uh, so beautifully that are strange, but not so strange. And if it gets too fast, it becomes questionable or the strokes become too short. So it's, uh, I would suggest not trying to be the world's fastest Isai ending, but trying to be somebody that speaks clearly, right? Speaks clearly and, and that controls that you, that you're playing things the way you want to. Um, I, again, there are lots of, of things to consider here. There's this. There's out and in. Right? There's the left hand. How we lift and drop. What the angles are to, for the fingers to fall comfortably and to be brought to the string in, in a way that's, that works. But if we pay attention to them, we can think about them and we can work slowly, 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 slowly. Yeah? Not excited. You can even watch a baseball game. Great thing to practice is 16 notes, yeah? Okay, I can focus on the string crossings or out and in on feeling arm weight, the three variables that I talked to you in the earlier videos about, about feeling string contact, hanging, 
and freedom of the hinge. The hinge is there. Yeah? We can go back to the basics. Add a variable. Add the wrist variable. Is my wrist free at the first one of the fingers? take bowing patterns. Remember I said that we can turn any piece of music into exercises and any exercise into music and that I don't like hearing um, either unable to imitate the other. That we, that we have to understand the relationship between mechanics and intention um, eventually. I think that um, when, you, when you practice this, you can make up lots of fun exercises. You can also practice it here. Okay, remember I said I didn't want it to be an exercise in speed, but we could practice. That way, if you decide to go like one of the faster players, go that way you you can um i don't want to um I, I would never say not to experiment with playing it the way this one does or the other i i like that i i do it a lot i'm a total thief but but um in the end let's let's do justice to what Isai wrote there's a, there are several other passages where he marks very clearly that he wants holbos uh, <laughs> Um, and it creates a, a feeling. Now, you don't have to get dogmatic about it because in the opening of the piece, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So you can go one. You can do homage to the opening that way. Um, so th that will help you. Now, I'm going to be putting up subsequent videos on how to approach the rest of the ballad. But if you practice it this way, and with all of the variations that I've given, this way also. In this case, we're feeling releases in both hands at the same time. The fingers are early, the, the, and the catch is early. The, the metronome is set so that you're feeling release at the moment of the metronome click. Advanced preparation. Um, that's a very important one. That's the, uh, the first one that I had Casey um, do when he studied this, and I'll tell you why. Look at the end of the Galamian book to the chapter on practice, and look specifically to the paragraphs on the building time, and Galamian's words on advanced mental preparation and correlation. And correlation is the idea that before any new technique is executed, there is a specific and clear mental and command for what has to happen. The reason that I like the Martelay so much is for that reason. I can prepare. And I can check that every connection between actions is legato in the left hand and free and prepared properly in the bow. That's probably the most important one, even though we're not going to play it that way. Yeah, that's not the point. The point is controlling your emotions and disciplining your sound production in the context of time. That's Galamian technique controlling the sound in the context of time. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you at the next video. We're going to discuss the Chrysler Cadenza for Beethoven Violin Concerto. Thanks for watching.